good morning. Welcome to Wanderlust. Welcome myself. I've never been to Wanderlust. <laughs> have any of you been to Wanderlust before? New timer. You have. And you're a re Ah, and you've returned. Good. <laughs> So it is an honor to be here and to be invited as part of the uh, core meditation uh, teacher group. And the uh, organizers decided they wanted to uh, integrate meditation into this beautiful festival of music and yoga and hiking and everything else. So most of the time it seems like you're going to be doing a lot. And so meditation, as you probably know, is the fine art of not doing anything, which is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> so this morning we have two hours, and in particular at this session, I want to talk a little bit about the Shambhala tradition of meditation. And then we'll focus on the practice of calm abiding, which also has some other names. Shamatha, Shine, mindfulness. So all of these are names for calm abiding. But I don't want to jump into that first because what's really of interest to me and I hope becomes of interest to you and your life altogether is to touch into motivation. And if you're a yoga practitioner, you probably will hear a teacher say at the beginning of class, you know, as you're beginning and what, you know, touch into your motivation or your intention. And so likewise, I'm really curious of why you chose to come to this particular class. A few people, I'd like to hear from a few people, why this particular class on Shambhala Path of Meditation and the Introduction to Calm Abiding? Anybody want to say why you are here right now? Yes, please. Well, I'm not very good at meditation. <laughs> Yes. Yes, yes. What's your name? I'm Tara. Tara. Yes. Such a good point is that um, many of these traditions we can, these days we can find on the internet. And we can read in a book and there's a plethora of books as opposed to when I started meditating 30 years ago, there was a small handful. But that doesn't, that's not really how you learn. So thank you for bringing that into it. Okay. Somebody else, a motivation for being here this morning. Yes. I come from the older area. I've always been pushing the practice. I guess what you call it, temple, or <laughs> but I haven't gone and was always curious. I um, practice at Shoshone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Good questions. Probably won't get addressed this morning, but a good question. But they could. There'll be time um, after we do this, and I'll be doing a little more introduction to Shambhala, and then we'll learn their practices, and I'll make sure there's time at the end for any kind of discussion related to meditation. So let's see here from one more person of the male gender just for fun. <coughs> now all the guys are going, <laughs> good, hey. We're on Grand Junction. Um, I was telling the neighbor here that years ago I used to practice meditation on a regular basis, kind of fall in front of it. And uh, just like to get back into it, I find it harder and harder more things going on in my life to take the quiet time. Yes. Right. Brian, right? Yeah. So another good point Brian's making is uh, often people learn a practice and to stick with it is hard. And meditation, even though it's, it's a very simple practice, it's very hard to integrate into your daily life and to do that, you know, month after month, year after year. And um, so it comes back to understanding something about your motivation and refreshing your motivation, which it sounds like you have refreshed your motivation, and to understand um, really what is meditation, because one reason that we stop is because we never fully understood. So our misunderstandings often lead us astray. For example, 
a common misunderstanding is, oh, well, when you meditate, you're not supposed to think. You shouldn't have any thoughts. Well, lots of luck, because that usually doesn't happen for very long, nanosecond, maybe longer. But that's not so much the point, and we'll get, about, get into that when I talk specifically about the practice. But that can be one of the most discouraging things. Monkey mind, <laughs> I give up. Who won? Monkey mind won. And now we're just back letting the monkey mind do what it wants. And okay, so who's heard of the word Shambhala before? Yeah. What does it mean? What do you associate it with? A place outside of Boulder. <laughs> okay. There's a big retreat center in, outside of Fort Collins called Chimbala Mountain Center. That might be what you're thinking. Pardon? One of the Rinpoche's. In fact, there's a film either tomorrow night or Saturday called Crazy Wisdom, which is about the founder of Shambhala, Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche. Yeah. It comes from the Tibetan Buddhist line, right? Yes. Okay. So Shambhala is a secular path of meditation, but I'll tell you the history about it in a moment. It, does, it has uh, connections to Tibetan Buddhism. Any other associations with Shambhala? Let's get it out in the circle. <laughs> like, I just heard the word. Just heard the word. <laughs> okay. Good enough. Sounds good. I forgot to introduce myself, and you probably are wondering how to pronounce my last name, right? <laughs> so it's Janet Salinchus, and I've been uh, part of Shambhala for about 30 years and part of uh, Naropa University where I teach meditation courses, and so clearly I've found my home in this tradition. So that's why I'll be offering it. Okay, so the word Shambhala is associated with two things. It's associated with peace, it's also associated with enlightened society. So it's a social vision. And it comes from a deep lineage. But the essence of it is learning about the art of being human. 